Hello and welcome to Enchanted Rose Costumes. My name is Marika and today I'm going to be sharing with you my first steps into the wonderful world of Battenberg Lace. As a disclaimer, this is my first time making point lace, so if you are a lace maker and you see me doing something wrong, please be kind. As I mentioned in my last video, I'm going to be recreating this 1890s evening gown designed by Charles Frederick Worth. So I have gathered pretty much all my materials, I just have a couple more things to get, but before I get started, I need to figure out how I'm going to make the elaborate lace collar that adorns the neckline of the evening gown. After a lot of research and even more squinting at the computer, I think I've discovered all the stitches that are used in the lace collar. There's still a couple that I haven't been able to figure out, but from the ones that I have figured out, they are the single brussel stitch, the double brussel stitch, the twisted single brussel stitch, the P stitch, the buttonhole net stitch, and there's a couple more. Oh, the bars and bars with picots. Now, the ones that I haven't been able to figure out, I think they are a combination of stitches because that's what happened with the buttonhole stitch that I was having trouble figuring out. So I'm going to continue exploring into that and hopefully I will be able to solve this conundrum. So the book that I'm using that have the majority of these stitches is this book right here and that is Starting Needlepoint Lace by Valerie Grimrud. So I will link this down below if you want to pick up a copy yourself. Um, it was published in 89 so I think it's out of print, I don't know, but you can find definitely secondhand copies online. Now, it is not a guide to Battenberg lace, but it does have a lot of information on how to make needlepoint lace, which has a lot of similarities to Battenberg lace. They use a lot of the same stitches. Battenberg lace just has lace tape. Now, there is a section in the book that tells you how to make a lacing pillow, so if that project goes well, you may see it on this channel. There is a book from 1912 that I found on archive.org, which is called the Priscilla Battenberg and Needle Lace Book which I will link down below if you are interested in looking into that. It goes into a lot of information about how to finish the cut ends as well as how to shape the lace tape, which is very helpful. So getting started today, what I'm going to be working on is a sampler. And to quote Priscilla from the Battenberg Lace Book, every lace maker should prepare a sampler upon which to reproduce the various lace stitches, which may be worked, cut out, and repeated until proficiency is acquired. And this without any danger of soiling or in any way spoiling the piece of work in which the stitch is to be introduced. If every stitch is practiced in this way, the worker in the end will have become familiar with the various stitches and have them illustrated in a compact practical form. Only those workers who have prepared them for use know the comfort and satisfaction to be had in the possession of a sample. End quote. <laughs> the simplest way to put it is if you're learning a new skill, you need to practice, which is why today's video is brought to you once again by Skillshare. I will share a little bit more about them later on in the video, but for now, let's start making lace. Needlepoint lace materials are fairly common and easily obtained. The following are the basic requirements needed to make lace. First off is the thread. Here I have a size 10 crochet cotton and a size 12 pearl cotton. Next is the lace tape. Well technically this is optional for needlepoint lace, it is needed to make Battenberg lace. For the tools, fine point scissors, a thimble, regular needles for basting, and ballpoint needles for making the lace, and a sturdy cotton fabric for backing, and a second plain cotton fabric that'll help the lace stand out. To make the backing for the needle lace, I cut one length of the sturdy cotton that was 18 inches by 60 inches and then folded it in thirds. Next I cut the contrasting fabric to the same size and hemmed the edges. Then, using my clover chalk pen, I drew out nine 3x3 three three squares for my sampler. Thank you. 
and then I cut lengths of my lace tape with a 1 inch margin on either side. Using a plain sewing thread, I basted the lace tape onto the lines, making sure to go through all the layers of the backing fabric. Once the tape was all basted in place, I then pinned the backing fabric to my sewing table and began lacing. Starting off with my size 10 crochet cotton, I cut an arm's length worth of thread and used two buttonhole stitches to secure it to the top corner of the lace tape. The first stitch I practiced is the single Brussels stitch. This is the easiest stitch to learn, but it has a tendency to ride up, which throws off the tension. I did use some thread anchors to help with that problem, but they didn't completely solve it. To finish off the square, I whipped the loops of the last row to the tape lace and secured it in the corner with two buttonhole knots, and then I removed the threading. So I've finished the first square. My tension is still a little off. Um, this area right here, the tension is correct because it's got that looping effect. But other than that, um, yeah, I'm pretty happy with my first time. There's like some areas in here, like this is where I joined or I just joined in the thread. It's a little bit lumpy, so I have to figure out a way to uh, make it less lumpy in the future, but for my first time, I'm actually quite happy. So on to the next square. The second stitch I practiced is called the twisted Brussels stitch. It is very similar to the first stitch, except that there is an extra twist added. So once again, I began by fastening my thread with two buttonhole knots. To create the twist, I made a small loop with the working thread. Then I took a stitch through the top of the lace tape and wove the needle over and then under the loop and tightened it. To finish off the stitch, I once again whipped it to the lace tape and finished it in the corner with two buttonhole knots.
The third stitch is the double Brussels net stitch. Again, it is very similar to the single Brussels stitch, except for this time, two stitches are worked close together. You can kind of see as I work these stitches that my tension is slowly improving. I had the 1995 Pride and Prejudice opening theme playing in my head while editing this part, and I really wish I could have used it, as I think it fits this perfectly, but alas, it is copyrighted. The fourth stitch I practiced is the corded single brussel stitch. It starts off much like the single brussel stitch, except for once it reaches the opposite side of the work, it is brought back to the beginning and the process begins again. I've just finished up the fourth one and I'm not too thrilled with it. I pulled too tightly when I was um, putting the threads across, um, I guess back to the starting point, and so it's caused the uh, lace tapes to kind of bow in. So that is something I have to keep an eye out for in uh, future, future endeavors with this stitch. The fifth stitch is called a P-stitch. It is made of alternating rows of single and double Brussels stitches. The first row is worked in the double, and the second row is worked in the single. It is a fairly quick and easy stitch to make, which I absolutely love. So now that we've reached the halfway point in today's lace making adventure, I figured I'd give my lace making self a bit of a break and talk about today's sponsor. If you're not familiar with Skillshare, they are an online creative community with thousands of different classes in many different categories, such as creative writing, fine arts, photography, film and video, and sewing, and many, many more. I am currently taking one of their classes on lighting, which is very helpful because it's really nice for people to be able to see what you're doing in a video. The classes on the subject can be as short as 15 minutes or up to several hours depending on what the subject is. Skillshare is definitely a great place to learn new skills or expand on your current skill set. And if you click the link in the description, Skillshare is going to give you two months of premium membership for free. And after that, it's less than $10 a month for an annual subscription. Thank you so much Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get back to lacing. The sixth stitch is the one that I was very excited to work on because it is one of the most prominent stitches used in the Worth collar. It is also one that I had a very difficult time finding, but thanks to all you lovely subscribers, I was able to solve that mystery and give the stitch its name. And that name is the Buttonhole Net Stitch. Starting off, you'll see that this stitch is slightly different from the other stitches as it starts on the opposite side of the work. The first row is worked with a spaced single Brussels stitch. 
The second row is worked with a triple Brussels or buttonhole stitch in the loops. And the third row is once again the single Brussels stitch, and the stitches are worked into the tiny opening between the buttonhole stitches. So I've just completed my sixth square. My voice sounds a little funny because it's pretty late right now. Um, you can, this is how the stitch is supposed to look. It's the buttonhole, buttonhole net, I think. Um, the first section of it was pretty good, minus like that little bit there, but you can see as I went on, I am slowly, progressively getting tired and my stitch is getting a lot wider apart. So this area is not correct, um, but this upper area is what the stitch is supposed to look like. Like, this right here is like perfect. <laughs> and this stitch is one that's one of the main ones on my Worth Young collar. So if you look at, yeah, I did a big printout of it. <laughs> this is, that is that stitch right there. So it's very tight um, and it shows up several times in, in the collar. So yeah, this much looks a lot more like this one over here. Um, except for this one's a double and a single Brussels, and this is a triple and single Brussels. So, yeah, lots to do. But, yeah, onward and upward. The seventh stitch is the four-hole diamond stitch. It is started off much like the corded single Brussels stitch, but the difference is the diamond and that is made by leaving unworked loops. To create the stitch, first I decided where I wanted to place my first diamond, and then skipped three loops and finished the row. In the next row, I stitched as usual, but I skipped the three loops before the underwork section from the row above. I then caught the unwork section, and then skipped the next three loops on the opposite side, and finished the row with the usual stitch. In the third row, I worked the stitches in the unworked section from the row above, and then skipped the three loops in the middle once again, and then continued the stitches as usual. And in the fourth row, I stitched as usual to finish the design. I then repeated this process twice more in the square. The eighth square is another P-stitch, but this is one of several variations. The first row is a space double Brussels stitch.
The second row is a combination of single and triple Brussels stitches. The single stitch is worked in between the double Brussels stitch, and the triple is worked on the loop. In the third row, the double brussel stitch is used once again, and it is worked on the loops of the triple brussel stitches. This combination is then repeated into the bottom of the square. To finish off the square, it is whipped to look like a double brussel stitch and then tied off with a buttonhole knot. So I am very happy with how the stitch came out. So you can see this side is much tighter than this side. I think when I start on this side, I tend to have a tendency just to go a bit looser. And then when I get to this side, I realize I'm running out of thread and start going tighter. So <laughs> yeah, this one, I definitely like how it turned out. I'm very happy with it. Yeah, I don't know. It's so pretty. And it's really cool because like this one, is the same as this one except for this one is just the single and double um p stitch and this is the single double and triple p stitch so i'm very happy with it it is time for the final square so I am really happy with how the stitches all turned out, but for my final square, I think I'm going to use or do this one again, just because this um, stitch is quite prominent in the Worth Gown collar, so I definitely want to try and practice that a little bit more. Uh, instead of using the size 12 cotton crochet thread that I've been using, I want to try moving to a thinner one. So this is the, is this the 12? Oh no, I think this thread was the 10 and then this is the 12. So I'm going to try using the 12 now for that stitch in here. So it's be a little bit different. The thread will be a little bit smaller, but I want to see how that stitch will turn out because I won't be using the larger size on my worth collar and I definitely want to see what it'll be like with the thinner thread. So because I already completed the stitch earlier in the video, I don't really have anything else to add. So I hope you enjoy. So I have taken this square out about three times now. <laughs> It's taken me about two and a half hours just to get this far. I didn't realize how much of a difference the um, thread thread would make. I knew it was going to be a bit of a difference because of it's slightly thinner. But holy moly, that is thin thread and that is taking a long time. Um, you can also see here I've... So that's one, two, three four rows so far and that is my anchor thread that I've just put in there. So I am 
a little over halfway on this square. Um, I have the three anchors in there and that's really helped with the tension. Um, <laughs> this square has taken me a while. I think I'm at around six and a half hours now. Uh, the thread difference, like the size of the thread really makes a difference. Um, just compared like how many there are there compared to the same area. Um, how many there are here. So yes, this, this thread is definitely, um, or this square is definitely taking a long time for it to come together, but I think I'm definitely going to get it finished on, or get it finished by tonight. And yeah, you can see my little anchors and these will all come out, um, once the square is finished. So tension for the most part has been really good. You can see like it's in this one, I, the tension at the top was good and at the sides, but then in the middle it started to go wonky. And in this one with the thread anchors in there, it's really helped keep the tension correct. So yeah, onward and upward. Not gonna lie, I was so excited to be almost done this square, so I have to share the ending moment. took me eight hours which is insane um but yeah it's not perfect there's a couple areas that I still need to work on like the tension up here is great and then down here I went kind of loosey-goosey and then I kind of got it back at the end one thing I need to remember with this stitch is right there I don't want to make these stitches too tight that's something that happened as I got further down here, these stitches got way too tight in here. Um, and it's like same with these ones. They're all just a little too tight. They're a lot too tight. These ones right here though are pretty much amazing. And then I get to undo all the basting stitches and see what it looks like with the tension gone from the basting stitches. So it comes the moment of truth. It is time to remove it from the backing. So you can see the crisscrosses. It is greatly recommended to remove the basting stitches from the back side of the work so that way you aren't in danger of accidentally snipping your finished piece. That would make me cry if that happened. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's video. I am really happy with how this sampler turned out. I mean, it's just, it's just beautiful. I totaled up my hours for this and I think it came to roughly 34 hours to make this. With the longest one being, you know, eight hours right down here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it was on average about each square took about three hours. Some of them of course took less, some of them took more. But on average, it was about three hours. So I don't know what I'm going to be doing with this yet. I do really love how it looks. And I don't know if I'm going to turn it into something or if it'll just end up in a book um, of samplers. I would love to know which of these stitches was your favorite and if you might be inspired to try needlepoint lace for yourself. So before I start on my next piece, I actually need to create a lace roll pillow or a bolster pillow. I think that's what it's called. I don't know. I've come across several different names online, so maybe it's different in regards to like where you live. So we will see. But if that goes well, I will hopefully be sharing the process with you. And if it doesn't go well, then it will never see the light of day. Now, before I start on the larger collar, I do want to try a smaller sampler collar. And there are a couple Edwardian patterns that I've come across on Pinterest that are absolutely beautiful. So I guess my question is, would you be interested in seeing me make up one of those lace collars 
um, as kind of a sampler? Or would you rather I wait until I'm working on the actual collar for the worth gown? Leave your answer down below and that'll kind of help me weigh in on my decision on whether or not I'm going to be putting out more samplers or just going straight to the worth gown collar. If you are new to my channel and you liked what you saw today, feel free to hit that subscribe button and maybe click the bell as well so you'll be the first to know when my next video is out. Thank you so much for watching today's video and again thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. I hope you all have a lovely day and I'll see you next time. Bye! Valerie Grimwood. <laughs> Valerie Grimwood. Or I may just break down and buy myself a really expensive pillow for a project that I may only use once. Hmm. So thank you so much. Thank you so much.